25th hour radio show. Hello. Hey, Carmine. This is Robert. There you go. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Sorry about the mix-up on the time zone. Okay, cool, man. No hey, problem. Hey, uh, I had to ask you. I was on your Twitter page last night, and uh, I saw that uh-huh. you, you're into painting now. Is that is that a hobby of yours? Is that a source of income now? Well, no, not a source of income. It's just been something I've been screwing around with with my, my friend who's a who's an artist, and you know, he's a real artist. I mean, he makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on it. And, uh, but, you know, one day, uh, he's a friend of ours. My girlfriend here is, a, is in radio. She's a radio talk show host uh, in New York, like a female Howard Stern, for many years. And um, he's one of her fans. And so... Whenever he would do an event, she would do an event. He would come, and we met him, and he'd give us some paintings for the for the studio and stuff. So little by little, you know, I became friends with him. Whenever I did in New York, he would come, and and then he 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 would do the uh, New York Art Show, you know, like the which is like a convention, you know. Yeah. And uh, and we would go to see him, and uh, and one time I went to see him, and I saw Paul Stanley there, you know, and Paul Stanley does painting, you know, so. So he said to me, "Do you paint?" I go, "Not really." You know, I said, "But I, I can make, you know, I can draw like drum sets and and stuff like that. And maybe we could do in the way he works. He he does his stuff that looks like uh, like kitty art, you know." Yeah, yeah. And she looked up his name at at heck, and I said, well, "I could certainly draw that kind of stuff, and maybe we can do some that way." So we started and we experimented. And, we came up with this first piece called Drum City, which was actually a city made of drums. Oh, that's awesome! You know? And the and the colors we put together were, were really really awesome. And then what he does is we 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 I draw it, and then we go I go to his studio and together on the computer we put together all the colors. And then he goes, you know, I need some more cars. And I need some cars in the streets. So I will draw some cars, and he would insert it. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So then that's where we would get the lithograph from. And then he would take that the black outline of that drawing and he'd project it onto the canvas. And then he'd just trace it. Right? Yeah. So he gets my drawing on the canvas and then he would actually paint it. So what you saw there was something that I drew and we colorized together on the computer and then he projected it and actually painted it on the canvas. But if you get the lithograph, you'll get more of what I drew then when you get the, uh, the the canvas, you get more of what he traced from what I did. So was that like your main hobby outside of uh, playing? No, no, that's not a main hobby. So we've been we've been working on it over the last couple of years, just talking about let's do you know. So then I started doing different things. I did like the Leaning Tower Tower of Drums of you know after the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I did uh, the Moon Landing, you know, with where the Instead of the satellite dish, it was a uh, symbols on the on the thing, and the and the the actual spacecraft was made of drums, you know, stuff like that. And then I did uh, the, the pyramids, and we did Stonehenge done with drums, and just a lot of things. I did, you know, another city, and with a city bridge, and the bridge was made of a hi hat, you know, so stuff like that. So it's a whole. Thing from around the world, and I did different ones. I did the you know, Taj Mahal. I did, um, you know, Paris. We did the uh, Eiffel Tower. You know, so all recognizable stuff. Forty Second Street and Broadway. You know, that kind of thing. Times Square. You know, so we did it all. All the stuff is made of drums. They look like drums. You know, that's so pretty. It's a unique kind of concept. So eventually, when we get it all done. I even did like some in Bermuda, you know, houses with the colors of the houses they have in Bermuda. And uh, when, it, when we have it all done, we're going to do a showing and do like a Carmine piece and, and Ed Heck world tour in a gallery, you know? That's pretty cool. Because the, all, the, all the paintings will be from different parts of the world. Or the Tokyo, or the, China, the Wall of China. <laughs> it's crazy. But it, it's fun, you know? I, I mean, it's... I haven't done any new paintings lately because he has to catch up to me. You know, he's, uh, I have to actually, probably this month I'll probably go over there and we'll, uh, and we'll look. But funny enough, uh, some people on Twitter ask me what else we have if they're interested in buying some of them. Because, you know, we, you know, we sold a few lithographs, you know, and she still is in New York here, but, you know, um, 
it's not really a, a, a business, you know. It's just more it's just fun to see what we can make, you know. Hey, Carmine, how you doing? This is Randy. I'm Rob Sidekick. <laughs> Hey, Randy, how are you? Oh, man, I'm I'm absolutely excited about talking to you. Have you ever thought oh, about, great. Fantastic. Have, have you ever thought about putting, like, like a larger lithograph or something behind behind you as you guys do a set or anything? Yeah, no, but I thought about, like, with this uh, painting, Drum City, I thought about putting one in a mini, um, those mini, uh, I, uh, what do you call it, the um, iPods, mm-hmm. really small ones. And loaded up with a song that I had on my solo album called "The Ballad of Drum City Rocker," you know. So I thought that would be cool to have like a little speaker and a little iPad attached to the painting called "Drum City," and that way, you know, it, it's not only like a, it's it's sort of like the visual, and it, it also has the audio to it, you know. That's real. But cool. no, I never really thought of putting that behind you. It'd be, it would have to be huge, <laughs> unless I was calling something Drum City, you know. Yeah, it really would doesn't make sense. But well, I wanted I know, wanted to talk about that because I, I I've been researching you a lot here the last couple of days, and I've been looking up stuff on YouTube and you know all kind of your old interviews and stuff. And I wanted to bring something different to the table. I know you haven't talked a lot about right. you know your paintings and stuff, and and the picture that I saw with you last night. Now was that was that at the studio? Or was that at your house? No, that was at the studio. That was in that, in that studio. Okay. And, uh, I mean, I didn't really paint it, you know. It, we just took a picture like that to make it look like I painted it. Yeah, and like you said, everybody was asking you about where they could buy it and stuff. That's why I asked you, is that a source of income, or yeah, could it possibly yeah. be a yeah. source of income? Well, it could be. I mean, it's, like, it's like anything else, you know. It's like, like I've been wanting to write a book in my life for years, but not until the last three or four years that I actually put time and effort into really doing it. You know, mm-hmm. you know, I make it happen, you know, like, uh, you know, anything that you put the time and effort in, like right now, uh, my next goal to try and achieve is to get into like lecture speaking, you know, corporate speaking and, and speaking in colleges about uh, the history of rock. Yeah. Because you know, I lived it, you know, mm-hmm. you do a lot of, you do a lot of seminars. That. Yeah. I know you What's do. That? I know you do a lot of seminars and stuff, drum seminars, and, and if I'm not mistaken, you, you I, do a lot I of do, it for free. Well, it's for free to the people. I mean, I always get paid, paid for it, but I mean, the uh, that whole market is sort of going down the tubes because there's too many people doing it, and in order to do those, the stores have to buy a certain amount of drums, and with the economy the way it is, everybody's down. Yeah, you know? that's for sure. I mean, there's still there's still some of them, you know. I still do maybe a dozen a year, you know, but it used to be, you know, five years ago, I was doing like 30 a year, you know? Yeah, he's putting in the time. (laughs) Yeah, but I came up with this idea to do this this speech in uh, in colleges, you know, about about the history of rock, because there's a lot of classic rock college courses now out there. So Mm -hmm. I have a girl trying to book some uh, stuff. Like I did one my first couple at the uh, School of Rocks, which is a you know, um, school for kids to, to learn to play rock music. I did one in uh, Fairfield and one in New Jersey, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it's fun to do that. But now I'm, I'm, I want to do the corporate thing, too, because there's people out there doing, you know, a corporate motivational kind of clinic uh, um, speech and talking about, you know, use the techniques of a rock star to be successful in your business. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just crazy. You know? How how, how and, soon could you do you think that something like that would uh, work out for you? Well, I don't know. Right now, I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm working a bit with this guy in Texas who does this for a living, and not only does he do speeches, he also preps speakers to for their program. And uh, you know, he's uh, he's like his thing is you know the same kind of thing. You know, like um, techniques of being a rock star. How, it's, how you cross over and use those techniques in business, you know. So he's helping me out with uh, a bit. He gave me some material to look at. Through that material, I came up with some ideas. I, I just sent him my my idea of an outline for what that speech would look like, and he said he thought it was great. You know, so right now, as a matter of fact, before you called me, I was putting together the bullet points that he said that the best thing I should do is make up a, a, my own website, you know, so I could send people to the website 
and uh, have some bullet points on there. And then I have to do a little video with this motivational part of it, you know. So there's still a little work to do yet. And then, and then once you get all that up and ready, then you can go to speaker bureaus, and then you can go to different, you know, corporations and different things. And I have a manager also that's working on that. So, uh, you know, I'm just uh, because for, for me it's easy to do that because I've done so many clinics. So I'm easy. You know, it's, it's easy to be in front of an audience. I've, you know, I've, I've taken. It would be entertaining, it would be inspiring, and it would, it would really take the techniques that I had to, that I survived with in the music business and, and brought them over to regular business. So, because it's all about the same thing, believing in yourself, you know, focus, passion, you know, it's all the same stuff, you know? You know and, uh, you know, so hopefully we'll be getting that going, and then when I go do these gigs, I don't have to take a band with me, you know? You, you cut all those expenses, you know? But I'm still doing a lot of shows and a lot of gigs, too. So I'm just having a good time doing a little bit of everything, you know? Well, you talked about uh, the history of rock. You're definitely a part of it. There's no doubt about that. Can we can we talk about Vanilla Fudge a little bit? Sure, sure. How in the world did you guys come together? Well, uh, basically, it was easy. Uh, our the, the scene in New York City and Long Island at the time was all these big production numbers and slowing things down. And I was playing in one band, and these guys came up to me one day at a gig in New Jersey and asked me if I'd be interested in, in playing with them because you know, they had heard about me in the in the scene in New York that I had a good right foot, I was a really good technical drummer, and I could sing, you know. And, uh, you know, and this is one of the things I used in, uh, in the speech thing because... That to me was like a major change, you know. It was a, it was a it was a lifetime change decision I had to make up, you know, mm-hmm. a decision of change that, you know, life changing decision really, because basically you know I was happy with my friends and I and I had to look at these guys and say, well, well, what do you got to offer me, you know? And they told me they had a manager that would pay us a salary and they wanted to like, you know put this thing together and jump in on this new craze that's going on in Long Island and really be successful and, you know, pack out all these houses like this group called the Vagrants that we're doing, you know? And then they said, and eventually maybe record some records and, you know, try and become a recording act. So, so again, for me, that was a life-changing thing, that, you know, and I had a big fear of, should I do it or not, you know? And, you know, and the way to conquer the fear is to get all the information you can on whatever you're fearful of. So I did. I met with the manager. He told me everything he wanted to do. He said he had connections. He ended up being a mafia guy. He really had connections. <laughs> his, his connections were the guys in the good sellers. Those were his guys, you know. And and basically, uh, you know, I made the decision to go with them, and we started working on this material. And the material wasn't dance material. It was more like everywhere we went and played this stuff, people would stop and look at us. And, and come up and watch us because we were so dramatic and so energetic and that we were great players and great singers. And the stage show we put on was very high energy with drama, mixed with drama, and, and people loved it. And, oh, yeah, you know, we, basically, yeah. you know, we, we did the demo of You Keep It Hanging On, put it on the radio in New York, which was the first FM underground station at the time, and, and people loved it, and Atlantic heard it, and they signed us. Next thing you know, nine months later, we were on the charts. I'm telling you, I, I rock that song out all the time. That's probably one of my favorite songs that you guys yeah, do. Yeah, it's an amazing song. And you no, know why I mean, it sounds so powerful? Unbelievable. It's mono. It's, it, well, it's mono. Well, let, yeah, well, let, let me ask you something, man. How do you how do you guys decide what song, I won't call it cover, I'm going to say arrange because there's no cover about that at all. How do you, you how know, do you, we look at the lyrics. We look at the lyrics and go, okay, you know, that song, you send me free, why don't you, babe? Get in my life, why don't you, babe? You know, you really don't want me. You just keep me hanging on. It's, it's you know, I mean, anyone in that love situation knows that those aren't happy lyrics. No. You know? They're emotional, dramatic lyrics. So we just tried to put the music, you know, to complement where the lyrics really are and what they're about. And, and then we would add intros that stay in the same vibe of the music, you know? So that song was sort of, we slowed it down and we made it a little more dramatic. So we had to make the music, the intro dramatic. So, 
you know, Walt Stein came up with some an organ part, and then we added all of our parts, and the next thing you know, we had the seven-and-a-half-minute song. That when we recorded it, we did it in one take mono. That's why it's in mono, because we did it in one take, you know? Yeah, well, when you and, guys uh, come in on backup, that is awesome. You just, you just come out of yeah, nowhere, man. Yeah. Yep, yep, it's, a, it's big. And, you know, and I say that was seven-and-a-half minutes that changed my life, and that all came from that life-changing decision I made to go over there, you know? If I hadn't done that life-changing decision, no, nah, you know, I think I'm going to stay with my friends here. I'm making good money. You know, none of those guys I was with made it. You know, mm -hmm. good so decision. <laughs> it's all about opportunity and taking the opportunity, a life changing decision, taking that opportunity and turning it into, you know, your focus. You know, we focused on putting our music together, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a lot of imagination. We had passion. We had all the elements that create success, you know, and that's what happened. And everybody had to do their part. The manager had to do his part. The producer did his part. The record company did their part. The band did their part. If somebody would have faulted, nothing would happen. No. You know, I was watching another interview you did a couple of days ago, and you were uh, playing a snare. I think it was a snare. Yeah, I might be wrong, but you're playing it like a guitar. You know, I've never seen right. anybody else do something like that. Is that something you came up with? Because that was really yeah, cool. I came up with that from, from my drum war show with my brother, and we're, we're we've been doing. Uh, Last year, we did maybe 25, 28 gigs with, with, with drum wars. This year, we're, we're just starting to get it going again. I, I'm, I'm sitting here with uh, with rotator cuff surgery two months ago, so I can't really play till April. Yeah. You know? Or we, we were touring now with, um, with drum wars, but we had to move everything back, so we start in uh, May <clears throat> with drum wars doing a Canadian tour, and we got... Two, two drum wars clinic gigs in uh, Chicago, and then we got you know another couple of gigs being added onto that, and then we got a, a lot of another one going in in June, and I think we're going to go to Europe in in September again. But so I I came up with that with with that show because I had the idea to do it, but I really have nowhere nowhere to do it yet. You know I have. My other show, which is a slam show, which is like a stomp thing, we don't do many of those. And when we started developing this the drum war show, I said to my brother, look, why don't I play this snare drum like this, and we'll come up with some stuff that we'd use it at it. So and we did. And then as I started developing it, I used to sit down on a chair and play it. And I said, you know, I'm going to put it on a guitar strap and see how that works. And I put it on a guitar strap and, and put a mic on it, and before you know it, I can walk all over the stage with it, you know, and then, and it looks really cool. Yeah, you know? it sounds and really cool. Love it. Yeah. And people, and people love it. Would you saw that on the, uh, on YouTube? Yeah, I saw that on YouTube. I can't remember what channel it was, though. You were getting interviewed by a, a, a lady, and uh, you was at, oh, okay. was at a show. You was at a, some sort of show, and you was doing it. You gave a little bit of a, a, a demonstration of it, and I was like, wow, I've never seen anything like oh. that before. Oh. Yeah, people love it when they come. When I come out with that on, everybody's mouth drops and they go, "What? <laughs> What's this?" You know, <laughs> and you know, and I'm thinking that I, I can develop it more and put it like to a wah wah to, you know, special effects and stuff. You know? A whole new sound. I mean, it would be awesome. You yeah, know? it would be awesome. Now you talk about your tour kicking off in May um, in Canada. What kind of show can the audience expect for those that haven't seen you two perform yet, you and your brother? Well, basically, what we do is we mix up um, our drum battle stuff, which is you know like the old Gene Cooper and Buddy Rich drum battle, which was very famous in the '40s and '50s. Uh, we mix that up with playing the heavy metal music and, and just heavy rock music we're known for. Like we would open up with the Mob Rules from Black Sabbath that my brother played on, and you know he was on that album and on the tour, and we play that one together. You know, mm -hmm. and then we have a, drum, a song called Drum Wars, which which I basically wrote, and we uh, we play that with the band, and then it goes into this drum battle thing back and forth. Then after that, Vinny would play two songs that he played with Dio, like We Rock and Holy Diver. You know, mm -hmm. and then after that, we would play this song called Flintstones, which is based off of you know the the, the song for the TV show, the Flintstones song. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, we do a little piece like that's about three or four minutes long. And then after that, I would um, 
I come out, I do uh, a drum solo, you know, on my own. And then I come back, I stay on, and I do Do You Think I'm Sexy Done Heavy, like I did for my Guitar Zero record, mm-hmm. you know. And then after that one, we would do Bark at the Moon, you know. And then that would be my song. Then we, then he comes back and we play Lady Evil from, uh, from Heaven and Hell uh, together, or is it Black Sabbath? I think Black Sabbath. We play that one together, you know. Is there ever then, a is uh, there ever a winner? Is there ever a loser? Is no, not really. A I mean, I mean, you know, we we go with the audience. Then he'll go, ah, everyone votes for me. Let me hear you clap. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I would do the same thing. And we, you know, we harass each other, and you know, we we have some funny bits in between. You know, so, but, uh, you know, by the end of it, you know, we, we do a crazy train, which we exchange four bar breaks in, it's in crazy train, you know, and then we do, uh, then he does his solo, at the end of his solo, we really go for, like, you know, the, the battle to kill each other, you know, and then uh, that's the end of the show, you know, and then uh, we end with crazy train, and then um, we go off and come back, and then I switch his drum sets, he plays mine, I play his. And then we do Paranoid together, which we both played. I played it with Ozzy. He played it with Black Sabbath. Mm-hmm. You know? So so it's really a, a, a drum show based around the songs that we were made famous with the with the artists who we played with and who the fans we were part of. You know? how, how gratifying is it to be able to do something like that, like Drum Wars, with your brother? Well, it's fun because, you know, I mean... Uh, especially for me, because, you know, he was eight years old, nine years old. When he took me in the, in the little room in the, in the front porch of our house in Brooklyn and started playing my old drums, you know. And, you know, I realized, I said, wow, who taught him that? My mother said he taught himself. I said, wow, he's, he's got the talent. You know, when my father's side of the family, including my, my son plays a bit now, I had like nine drummers on that side of the family, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and my brother, me and my brother to make it, together as, as drummers and make it, you know, to the point we have, where we're both called legendary guys, you know, people will go, well, who's better? You or better? I go, I'm the original. <laughs> <laughs> you got yeah. seniority. I got seniority, exactly. <laughs> hey, uh, do you mind t- letting everybody know uh, where they can go and get more information about you and all your business that you're attending to, like your social media and website? Yeah, you can go, you can go, to, you, well, you can go to my website, carmanapiece.com. It has all the touring I'm doing. Because, you know, my first tour is in April with Cactus in Europe. I grew Cactus, you know. Mm-hmm. So the, the, good, the good thing about my career now is I don't have to be one band. It's sort of like when the big big band guys, you know, got to, you know, my age and they got to the, per se, le- legendary status. You know, they play with this band, then they go play with another band, then they have another band. You know, you are locked into one band. So, like... You no, know, my first gigs are with nine gigs in Europe with Cactus, and then I do the the one with uh, Vanilla. F- I mean, with um, with uh, Drum Wars, and then I do uh, in June we had uh, a bunch of gigs with uh, Vanilla Fudge and Drum Wars. I also have a King Cobra album coming out at the end of June. You know, mm-hmm. uh, brand new King Cobra album. In July it's back to uh, with Cactus, and we're doing some shows up in Canada, some festivals, and we go back to Europe. You know, so, and then in uh, August, I have a, my drum camp, which I'm doing. That's pretty interesting, because uh, I have uh, myself and uh, Eric Bloom from Blue Oyster Cult, uh, Eddie, Eddie O from uh, Twisted Sister, James Kotak, the drummer of the Scorpions for the last 12 years, and my friend Michael, Michael Badio, who's a guitar shredder, he's been voted the number one guitar shredder in all the guitar magazines for, for the past ten years, and he's uh, he's got like twenty million hits on his uh, on his guitar web uh, YouTube, you know. And uh, he's a really great guy. So we're doing this fan camp where you don't have to be a musician, and you just go in and you know it's really good priced rooms. You get the rooms and all your and all your food and everything for the whole four days we're there and get to hang out with us and we're doing sessions in the afternoon and like evening concerts kind of things at night, including jamming and teaching them how to play stuff. Even if they can't play, we're doing a Carmine cook-off, you know. Uh, so it's just a, a fan camp. It's like, it, it's well-priced and it's good, you know, because what it does, it feels like a, a payback to fans that have been following me. So, I mean, so that website is easy. It's com. 
you know, so you can check that out. But um, on on um, Facebook, I'm Carmine of Peace himself, and on Twitter, I'm uh, at Carmine of Peace One. You know, so and I do all those crazy things, and we're always trying to update awesome. the website. And, the website's got a lot of great stuff. You know, it's got a jukebox that has stuff that you can't really find anywhere, you know, and it has uh, even movies that you can't find anywhere sometimes. You know, I, I give my web guy unique stuff and he puts it up, you know. Well, talking about talking about movies, let me I got I gotta ask you one more question. Mm-hmm. When when King Cobra did the video for uh, Iron Eagle, did you guys really have right. to cut your hair for that or no, we didn't cut our hair. Was we, that, that cinematic? Yeah, we made it look like we cut our hair, but they took our hair and they greased it down and they turned it under and, and flipped it and all kinds of shit. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> That's all and, right. Uh, yeah, we're on, on the internet, it's okay. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so basically, but it looked good, though. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, it did. It's right after that video came out. We went on tour with Kiss, and people were going, how come you have so long? We just saw the video. And I said, ah, movie magic. You know, movie magic. Now, I, I got to ask you this. I, I don't want to be stingy with your time, because I know legends are busy people, yeah. that's for sure. But right, you right. mentioned Kiss, man, and I'm a big Kiss fan. You're friends with Peter, right? Yeah, I'm friends with Peter. I'm friends with all of them. I played on Paul's album, you know. Yeah, his solo album. Uh, yeah, you you keep in touch with all the people you play with. I mean, you've played with so many people. Have you have you made some lasting relationships yeah, with very, people? It, yeah, it's very hard, you know, because a lot of the guys I played with are English, and the English guys are very weird. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's true. You know, I mean, Nod Stewart is nice guy, nicest guy. You know, but you know, when you're not in this camp, you're not in this camp. You know, I hear you. John Sykes, the same thing. Ozzy, same thing. Jeff Beck, the same thing. All those English guys. <laughs> the guys like Ted Nugent, you know, I, I can call Ted on the phone, he'll answer. You know, I can call Rod on the phone, he never calls me back. <laughs> Jeff Beck never answers his phone, you know. I don't even have Ozzy's phone number anymore. John Sykes never calls back anybody back, you know. <laughs> the English are weird. An, it, must be, it must be an English thing. It must know? be. Well, Carmine, thank yeah. you very much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today on the show. We really enjoyed having you, and uh, you're welcome back anytime. Okay, man. We'll just uh, keep pushing my fan camp and uh, tell people to go uh, check me out on uh, CarmineFeet.com. That's all the tour dates for playing and, uh, and everything going on, all right? We'll get it out there. Thank you again. Okay, bro. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. Yeah. Radio Show. Show.